Like David said yesterday, uh, we're really for complexity and chaos as the best insurance and the best fun mm. and things happen unexpectedly. So I just really wanted to reiterate and I was so in, uh, in, uh, empowered is by that um, expression, uh, that uh, his uh, um, presentation yesterday and his workshop um, in that way. I'm sure you were, yeah? Yeah. So we go away um, three to five months a year now um, and leave our garden usually in summer which you might think is the most risky thing to do in a wet subtropical environment because weeds grow very fast. And, um, but we come back to a fairly productive garden because a lot of things are in the ground, there's a lot of perennials and there's a lot of self-seeding happening. So I thought toward the end of our presentation which we'll finish at 11, so we have an hour and a quarter, um, I would show you some of those things, yeah? Those kind of strategies. But um, to start with, we're going to go through the politics a little bit like the film last night. And then we'd like to hear from you as to what you do in your gardens for saving seeds, propagating, um, collecting local varieties, or if there's any chance of that in the future. Yeah, so what plans you might have if you're perhaps inspired by what we present and from the film last night. Um, so that you'll do in little groups. Uh, and uh, we also wanted to, to highlight our local seed networks because there's a few here today. Um, <laughs> Michelle, please. please. <laughs> Michelle, I'm doing the doors. I'm doing everything. That's good. details. So what have we been doing since we last came to an event like this. Um, we've been, three and a half years ago we finished our um, film Our Seeds and um, distributed 900 or so copies, Michelle's showing you now, um, in the Pacific and to various other organisations. So we made it for the people of the Pacific and then we looked around and we thought well we've done that and that wasn't that enjoyable. Most of um, most of our sanity was lost during that, that um, the editing process, and uh, Michel came up with the idea. He likes filming, but doesn't. We neither of us like editing particularly. Very few people like doing the edit. Everyone wants to be directing <laughs> and me behind. <laughs> so, but, but the good news is that we've been translated in Japanese. In Ch there's a Chinese subtitle version. There's a Portuguese subtitle version. There is a bon sonore uh, in, fr in French. Yeah. Mm -hmm. How do you say that in English? Aud audio. 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 Voice over. Voice over, yeah. Voice -over. Voice -over, yeah. In, uh, in pidgin English because uh, <laughs> people could not uh, read fast enough subtitles. And there is a Spanish <coughs> one coming. So the, the um, following year, 2009, we um, we were invited to Vanuatu from having visited Vanuatu and distributed films there and gave presentations to um, an amazing system they have there of um, culture guardians. So from the Vanuatu Museum, this is organised, and um, largely chiefs and other important people come in once a year and they report on whatever the previous topic has been. So say water or land or fishing or crops or whatever. And then they determine the uh, the topic for the next year. And they go out in their communities and collect stories, sometimes film these days, sometimes recording and mostly it's, it's written. And all this gets collected by the museum, so it's like a uh, rec record of their culture. Vanuatu, by the way, it's a very close neighbour, it's really yeah. worth a visit. It's been independent for, what, 30 years or so? And, um, and uh, it's a, a lot of their culture is intact, besides they have good carver. So we're lucky to meet all the coordinators that come once a year, the women apart, then the men come later, you know, well divided, then on the Islamic, but they have got their own tradition of uh, separation of sexes in some circumstances. So um, at the end of, toward the end of 2009, we went over there and we negotiated, um, rather cleverly we thought, to um, just do the filming 
uh, directing, filming, and get the, the footage in the can. So we did 13 hours in various parts of Vanuatu on a film we called Our Roots, or No Racine, because it was done largely in French for a French-speaking audience in Africa and the Caribbean and the Pacific. <coughs> so what do you think the root crops were? Cassava. Cassava. What did you say? Yams, taro. Number four, sweet potato. So we just did those four crops. And um, so it's called Our Roots. We haven't replicated them to, for uh, distribution because we're not particularly happy with the editing. It's a little scientific because we, we were commissioned by the uh, Centre, International Centre for Research and Agronomic Development and their man in Vanuatu. It's a French organisation. So um, we, we would like to play with it and get, make it a bit shorter. It's one hour and ten minutes. <laughs> but it's the most beautiful footage of people um, planting and harvesting and uh, in their rituals with these crops. And there's a story about diversity here because that's what uh, we like the wild card, don't we? We like this. And we, you too, all the seeds have a luck. The wild card because every time you save the seed you have a, a sexual propagation and you don't know mother and father is going to come out. He was going to bring it in at some time. <laughs> <laughs> and when we talk about taro, we talk about several species of taro. Mm. It's not actually one species of taro. And to talk about taro, and the end is the same thing. And um, in Papua New Guinea, not too far from uh, the Melanesian also, we were very surprised to hear that uh, some of the taro were absolutely useless. Mm -hmm. Let me talk about We've it. We've got some now. Yes. <laughs> and, uh, well, not this one exactly. And uh, I say now, why would those people keep plantation of it, not very well looked after, but it's there? Because it's tasteless, it's hot, it takes lots of time to boil it, there's oxalite crystal more than in other varieties. It's got all the wrong feature. It's not because they're collectors, it's because it's the famine food. They know that every 20 years you've got to go to that. Now, you've got rice coming from Ed. Japanese give 100 tons of rice to uh, Papua New Guinea in 95 during, and that kills diversity, and that kills resilience in communities. And what we found out, because everyone, you know, is involved in some kind of project, you know, whether it's here or whether it's in other countries. Community gardens are like an aid project, you know, helping other people. Uh, <coughs> we have uh, um, villagers that got rice during, in the Solomon Islands and in Papua New Guinea during the drought time. Uh, the village that got the rice were the ones that didn't replant their root crops. And if you don't replant a root crop, you actually lose it. And what happened is that a year later, there were some surveys, a PhD, native local person, uh, went and looked very closely at AIDS, and her founding was, and I've read it, that those villagers that got aid were helped by the village a year later that didn't get any assistance in rice. And if you give people tin, then we'll... You know, I mean, that might be helpful to give them tin, then they won't rebuild their thatch. And the, the plants that grow the thatch, you know, it's a, a whole uh, and still circle. Yeah. Mm. So look, over the years we've changed from concentrating on the seed to concentrating on the gardener. And, um, ups, you know, intending to upskill gardeners rather than think, well, we've got to keep these heirlooms. Every heirloom is precious. It's like something, it's like a museum exercise, that one. Um, whereas ours is, um, he, save the gardener and you'll save the seeds. So here you all are. Um, so the other thing that we've been doing is putting clips up on YouTube. So anytime anything happens in our garden, we go out to harvest, we prepare, from the, you know, we prepare the harvest, um, we save seeds, we dig something, we plant something, <laughs> just about every time. We, get, we film it, so it's sitting you know, here in the middle of you're starting to get your shovel and it's, you've got your hands nice and dirty and suddenly Michelle says, oh, wait a sec, we've got to film this. And <laughs> yes. communication, Bruce actually organised that when they said, here's a password, you register on YouTube, 
whatever you do, and then we, today we reach 1,000 clips. So, you know, one thing we can do, another thing we can do, I wouldn't have registered, you know, and, you know. Well, it was actually another friend in England who has a shiitake farm, and, and he showed you how to make a film yeah, of the, and the shiitake actually, he blew it, didn't he, and the little spawns went in, yeah, the, spawns. in the darkness, you so know. So you always get inspiration from other people, that's what community gardens are all about, mm -hmm. it's just inspiration from others, but it's also the, Giving of things. Do you want to show your equipment? That's the radio microphone, but we got one in. So that, one so in the here. radio microphone's this big. I've got one. Yeah, that's the other one, like you, you, you hear. And uh, this is a steady wonder. It's by no, <laughs> no mean necessary, and I can clip the phone here directly. Oh, we could, you could be on YouTube in and one minute. Then we, we are, yeah, virtually. <laughs> no. Don't feel free it's, it's okay. <laughs> <laughs> it's very, very quick. Yeah. Okay. <laughs> <laughs> and that's the, you know. So the that you need just a plastic bag with a bit of a brick underneath and, and a handle on your iPhone and something. And you can make that too. People at our hand, you can do it. You don't need all those products, you know. So anyway, that's st to keep it steady when you're pa panning, you know. Anyway, so three years ago, we um, got the iPhone and we went to India at your invitation in Udaipur. And there we were out in the back blocks of Rajasthan. And every village we went through, you know, we noticed we were online. And that's when we realised you could post to YouTube wherever you are, even in the deepest of India. <laughs> so there's a thousand clips and there are 40 something rather playlists. So I'll just read you the names of some of them. Um, spice gardens, wild seaweeds and algae, because we know seven species um, of algae having been taught by a woman from Vanuatu. The self-seeding garden. Um, deter wallabies, kangaroos, possums and bats from your garden. <laughs> because we've had a wallaby this year come in and we've had Christmas decorations out there, <laughs> um, all sorts. Um, Rolinia, uh, which is a species of uh, like a custard apple. Mania. Uh, it's like a cult. A chicken vlog. Uh, so it's a, a video blog. Uh, Samoan life and Polynesian ways. Organic garden nutrition. Um, best fruit from to grow organically and so on. And then there's seed saving, which is, which is uh, 100 videos. And the most recent one is recycled garden plants because we've made a new friend in Ballina, Trevor. And it's got Trev's new and used plants. <laughs> <laughs> and he's, he's on an, um, at a ca car yard, not car yard, so lots of concrete. And he's got half an acre of recycled plants. So he goes, he puts an ad in the paper and he says, I'll come and get your plants. So he's got huge palms right down to tiny, beautiful orchids, really ancient ones from old ladies' gardens and so forth. And then he sells them on. Oh, he's a real character too. So have a look at recycled garden plants. So you just go to youtube.com slash seed savers. About half of our films we make as we travel too. So in recent, this last year it's been um, Bali, Lombok, New Zealand, Portugal, France, um, Spain and Malaysia, where we were working in Malaysia with, with helping them set up a local seed network. And in Portugal, Shemetish Livresh, a tour on, you know, free the seed. We're great collectors, really. Like, I used to collect shells. I had like 20,000 about 30, 40 years ago. And uh, then we collected plants, and then we had like, you know, thousand. That, that's a little bit the problem. And we also have been collected of database. We had everything on database. Imagine how busy we got. And we had eight <laughs> volunteers and cooking and everything it was going crazy. <coughs> and, uh, um, and like David says, if you went to his lecture, all those, uh, uh, the 250 hours of footage that we clocked up in only two years, we won, like nearly we shot every second day. This in, is in, in 2006. Yeah, in 11 countries, right? And out of that, we made two documentaries virtually. However, there's a lot of things we haven't used, and that's what David was saying yesterday. There's all the stuff, oh, that's for tomorrow, you know, the, the collecting, you never use it. Where now, it's more in the now. Is that the difference between having a, a camera, a computer, and you've got to go through the cable and everything? 
this one has gone very quickly. I'm sure there's something definitely wrong with YouTube and all of that. Have we, have we sold this to you? We're actually representatives yeah. from... Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> okay. We must go. <laughs> so, David said yesterday, it's poor people who are the most creative. I'm in your way. How will we do this? Whose way will I be in? <laughs> no, you, you need to see my mouth, I think. You know, you need to lip read. So you'll be right? I'll be moving around. Um, and he said, poor people are most creative. And, and I thought, well, I always think that you eat best in poor people's houses. I mean, most, the most delicious meal I've had in recent times has been in a tiny, tiny village, way up. We had to catch a local bus up tiny, tiny roads. And they, everything they served with, they'd grown, you know. The oil crops, the, the dal, the, the chapati they made from sorghum, actually, and so on, the vegetables. And, and bread too. And they, and they had bread it. So it's not just that it's fresh, it's not just that it's local, it's not just that it's organic, it's not just that it's biodiverse, they bred it themselves too. <laughs> so that's why, that's why we, where we try and get when we um, travel. Up remote valley, mountain valleys generally. Can you see her face? No, not at all. She's all right. bad, actually. <laughs> she's in Rajasthan and she's bad. <laughs> and you can see there, there's something happening that She's got all the white corn here, and I said, take a picture, and she chose that. And she was putting all of that aside, and she made actually a cross in the middle, and I've seen the same thing with the, in India, or in another part of India, with Tibetan refugees. That's in our film, Kampadorma. And she also did the same kind of uh, Choice. selecting the red because they want to replant the red because they love colors, they love diversity, indigenous people love that. So where do we breed our, our crops from? Where did we 10,000 years ago and less? Um, get it, we got it from the wild. And so whatever we're eating are bush foods from somewhere. No, it's not just Australia has bush foods. So for example, in New Guinea, there's wild bamboo. Um, what's this lady's name? Two Tai. Two Tai. Yeah. 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 She's she because she So she's a collector of wild. Has <laughs> got a corn. Wild food, wild men. <laughs> and wild pandanus. So here's a species of pandanus, Victoriana. Um, that that um, long fruit is very fatty. There you are. You cook it, and it's very oily. So she only has it perhaps once a year. You know, we have some of our things in our garden only once a year. Um, wild ficus. Mollison, you was remind me that Mollison that we visit regularly just said. Uh, uh, two years ago, in my garden, I had a little bit, a lot of little things, a, 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 li a little bit of a lot of things. Sorry. That's right. So you never have a glut, virtually, <coughs> and you eat diverse. So the pineapples are smaller and and chunkier. Oh, um, the pit pit is uh, like an asparagus, a, a plant that grows. You know it? Yes, you know it? No? Um, and wild fern collected along the beach. So when we were in Dili in East Timor about 10 years ago, these kids were just out, out on the shoreline collecting all that, you know, sea lettuce. Oh, yeah, mm. In India, this is a collection of the, uh, tribal people, the Sologral tribal people made to show us both cultivated and wild plants. That, that, like amla, that, that's the fruit there. Mm -hmm. You know, the amla, the famous, yeah. you know, yeah. Medicine for come food. And Indians are really knowledgeable about their Vedic mm -hmm. foods, their wild medicines. And this is an example along the side of the road. What they call? Mish, they can't actually read the bottom. That's why it was a bit closer. People can't read. Wow. And all of the writings along the bottom. Um, so then, of course, where do, do crops originate. For example, maize, South America. And the kind of maize you see there is completely different to ours. It's chunky, it's irregular, it's smaller, um, although there's many, many types. Um, and yeah, so much more rustic. See this one? Sangre de Cristo? Christ blood. That's the name of the... Bien plus près de moi. And um, to Karma Dorma, Michelle was mentioning earlier, um, the Dalai Lama had uh, had um, prescribed that all Tibetans um, go organic. You have to talk into my chest. 
And, <laughs> <laughs> uh, and so these people who are Tibetan refugees near Mysore um, were growing corn. That's their, their livelihood. So what could they do? You know, the, all the hybrid corn that they had, totally addicted to chemicals, and the soil addicted to chemicals and so on, they had to revert to local tribal varieties. And that's what she, this is her second crop of those. But and we she, talked to the person who was in charge of uh, 22 villages of, uh, of Tibetan, not very far from each other, like 500 meters to close. And, and uh, he explained the way they were offered seeds by seed company as a goodwill gesture and a minute, you know, like the person that comes and gives it, there's no doubt, they, they love giving it. But it comes from the top, you know, <laughs> they're doing a job, they go and give seeds, they get a nice cup of chai and they're a little hero. And uh, they might do it twice in a row and then they give them a little bit of spray just to try to see what it's like, you know, a bit of a herbicide. And uh, it continues. That's, that's the treadmill we're talking about. Yeah. And it's certainly not evil or anything like that. At the top, is a little bit more calculating. So here's a plate of beans. So if you got some of those beans, you could work out which work in your garden. So when we get back from three or four years, three or four months of being away, it's the survivors that we're looking at, you know. And we've worked down to two types of beans. We virtually can't grow normal bush beans. We've got lima beans and pigeon peas, and we largely eat them as um, pulses. We do have a few cow, cow peas and occasional broad bean, and we have lots of peas, but I can't seem to get beans to grow very well in our coastal warm environment. So, you know, I've given up on adapting these, that kind, most of those beans to us. So, of course, in these small-scale crops that we're particularly interested in, it's women who are generally the guardians. So, we, we worked in East Timor, and, of course, arid crops are a challenge. So, there's an enormous difference between Indonesia, between Bali and the rest of Indonesia and um, Lombok, Flores, Sumba, and Timor in terms of climate and dryness. It's like Darwin. Like, yeah. So this is some cu a couple of shots now from um, markets on, in East Timor. So diversity is your insurance policy. We found one woman was selling the, all these beans, like they, maybe 10 beans yeah, or peas, cow peas. Um, there's so we use that in courses, right? We were teaching to uh, uh, agricultural extension officers that only have a you know, very low level of education and they also lost their traditional knowledge because they went to very poor schools. So they didn't know much either way. And they, well, after you say, well, they don't want to training farmers, they know 100 times less than farmers. So we say, listen, you've got everything in your possession, like I would say to a community garden, don't look any further, don't look at seed companies, even if they sponsor the event. <coughs> uh, just look at where the seed that you got in your community come from. For example, here you've got Fazerius, uh, Lunatus, that's <coughs> South America. You got North America. You got all your local mung beans, uh, uh, digna, that are native, domesticated, still wild, where there's still an integration between the wild and the cultivated. So they are the true breeders, because better than uh, scientific breeders, they're much more observant. They got a much more choice of seeds because they see them growing instead of having them in fridges and a description on the database in a research center. So those guys are really amazing. And you will introduce them a bean from a, that don't even grow in the area from somewhere else. And that's why the organization we work for at the moment that pay very well. That was great for seed sellers to actually get some income. Uh, that was Caritas. They were very kind, Catholic organization, but they bring seeds from Yates, you know, and from everywhere. And most many people would do that. Meaning what? So this is what I mean. In, this is a picture taken on the market. There's a whole mix of different cowpeas. Um, Don't underestimate those people ever. No. <laughs> That's the problem. And, and this is their like corn. The this is a corn. Once again, you know, a little bit irregular. Okay, let's now look at potatoes. Um, the Maoris have been growing, were growing potatoes before uh, Europeans arrived, and so these sh uh, shots are taken in um, New Zealand. Mm. So see the purple ones, mm. pink ones? Mm. <coughs> the moe moe? 
Um, this guy on the Otara market, it's got purple, dark purple uh, ones and orangey ones. So those potato arrive with the whalers, in, in the, given to the Maoris, a long time ago. And they still, one of them is called Peru Peru, from Peru. Um, <laughs> Direct link. Um, so, but there's lots of different tubers in the, from the Andes, so kind of like taking this as a case study, that are also eaten beside potatoes. What are these? Uh, Uluko, probably. Well, so, uh, because there's is... so many different altitudes in the Andes, mm. uh, so many different ecological uh, niches, the, <coughs> the people have huge diversity of and a huge diversity of species and huge diversity within species. Like here, Uluko, Uluko is completely uh, out of potatoes, it's got nothing to see with Solanons. But within the Solanon, they have potatoes of different species, of different genus of potatoes, that are actually and species. No, different. Varieties. No, 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 different uh, 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 species of that. Of so Solanon. Yes, yes. That, that, uh, that are suitable to every possible climate, up to 4,000 meters. Has anyone grown tuberous nasturtiums? No. And Northy Street in Brisbane? Oh, uh, there's in my back garden. Yeah, I didn't want to take it And did they grow okay? Uh, they weren't perfect, but they, there was small, small tubers, yeah. According to statistics, uh, Ulcos is the most grown tuber in the Andes, and it's very hard, it's sour, you need to ferment it, That's it's a poor people food, but no, no, the one before. Uh, the this one. one? No, before. That's Ulucus tuberosa. Okay, well, that's Ulucus. That, that, that's the tuberous uh, capucine. Uh, this one, Mashua. That's the one, the Mashua, yeah. Mm. In acreage and in consumption, it's the largest one, but I don't taste. But still, people keep it because, you know, it can't be too difficult on a test, you need to feed the family. And, and this, it's not this toxic. One, who's growing this one? This is tuberous oxalis. <laughs> We've got tubers of everything here. <laughs> so has anyone grown ochre? It's grown a lot in New Zealand. They call them yams. Yeah. Mm. Talk to people from South, South America. Is anyone from South America? Or their parents or their partners, their friends? No one? You're with me today. <laughs> Come on. Um, to, um, so... Huh? Yeah. Yeah, right. And they look like sow sobs, yeah, right? They have got that. Like yeah. um, so, on to Taro, one of our favourites, because we've had a lot to do with it in the Solomon Islands, where um, there were a thousand varieties collected in uh, it, uh, ten years ago. So this is a Taro fair, um, where 250 varieties were t collected and um, shown to people from all over the island of um, Malaita. Yeah. Yeah. Uh, sweet potatoes in New Guinea, that's their staple in the highlands because they prefer a cooler climate. And, you know, and yams. A lot of money were poured on that project. We supported some of the collection, initial collection. Then, you know, our, our little organization like us, supported with finance that was given to us, yeah? <coughs> uh, can go wrong. Uh, then uh, uh, an institution uh, that, that was the not CSIRO, uh, a very large one yeah. in Australia with a Graham Jackson, mm -hmm. and they had $5 million uh, budget A -C -I. to actually work on taro. A -C -I. So they, yeah, yeah. And they got all those amazing solutions, and we had a workshop with the people we collected with, uh, and, and the, 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 the guy in charge of the PhD, in charge of the program, and uh, when he told them <coughs> that he intended to actually do a tissue culture, he said, your whole island, all your diversity, and we could see them, there were lots. He said, would fit on this table here. In test tubes. My gosh, they could not believe it as it was going to be in test tube. And then after a tiny plant someone yeah. smart saying, how long does it forever? They said, no, every two years. You have to recollect every, every second year. But replant them. It's totally, and they do the same thing with sweet potato. We've seen some agricultural workers staying with us, coming in Australia to Gatton in Queensland where there's an agricultural school and they teach them techniques that cost a fortune where all they have to do is to save the seeds of the sweet potato and re-diversify. And Which that's how you read the, the, the sexual <laughs> propagation. You know what I mean? It's just uh, aberrant. And because we push money 
we push money towards the Solomon Islands because it looks good, doesn't it? And, and we got the, everything comes back to us. Simple, potatoes. and the film we made is about that, actually. The Rediversifying last, our roots. The last roots. 15 minutes of our roots is about rediversification through seed. So let's go on to rice. Um, in our film, Ranja de Silva from Gami Seva Savana in Sri Lanka, a sustainable yeah. agricultural um, group, says that <clears throat> with um, modern varieties of rice, you have to eat a plate. But traditional varieties, half a plate is sufficient. And this got me thinking, this is six years ago when we filmed him, and I thought, that's possibly why we're all so fat. Because we have to eat more food in order to find the nutrition, you know. What we get at the supermarket looks fabulous, but it's not providing us with the nutrition. So more of that later. And he's, so, so the traditional rices are often <coughs> colourful, black, purple, red. Lots of people collecting, that's what the Indian did, that's why we went to India, on the, uh, as by Vendana Shiva, because uh, they were only concentrating on rice in India, and they were right, because the rice is the most important food. But there rice are other, and chili you've eaten, There are lots of other grains that they eat, especially in marginal areas, like sorghum, and lots of different millets. There's some um, uh, foxtail millet on your right, <coughs> and... Uh, wow and another one, canarium millet, on your left. And by the way, that's a school visiting. Uh, uh, a seed uh, fair. It's a pancha, in a panchayat, it's those... Um, it's the local self-determination. John? Yeah, local self-determination, the local governance. Yeah. Like a village council. It's more mm -hmm. yeah. And uh, these are the kind of women who grow those kind of crops with their finger millet up on the top right. Um, they're standing in the way. Oh, no. um, and, uh, and that is a little local community seed bank. And these, and they, you know, this is not just for the camera, this is what they wear. <laughs> to go out and scrabble around the dirt and pick up the rice. <laughs> Goddess is dressed for the ball. Um, and these are the people be, uh, feeding the sorghum to their cows and they'll hand feed. The animal that they breed. Yeah, they choose mother and father, they, they, connect, they connect all of that. And uh, it, in comparison to uh, the diversity of uh, beef we have, where you know it's more the genetic has been, you've got the one father that serves millions of cows, very different. And those people are the keeper of diversity. So we're going, on, we're going on to bananas now because that's one of the things that have been domesticated in our zone, the Pacific and Southeast Asia, or near, near neighbours. Um, there are several crops in Australia that you're already aware of. I know macadamia, New Zealand spinach has been in French, for example, um, catalogues in the 19th century. Um, and uh, there's relatives of rice and um, chickpeas and sorghum out there in Australia mm -hmm. that they use for breeding. Yeah, tobacco also, soya bean, did you say that? Yeah. Okay, so East Timor. So here we go. Looks mm -hmm. awful, but tastes great. Mm -hmm. so Solomon Islands, mm -hmm. same. Very sweet. Um, we have 13 types of bananas in our place. Yes, yeah, that's Dorothy. Um, and she collected 130 varieties just on a small island with only 40 k's of road. She did it mostly by um, canoe going round and then and marching uphill. We put a thousand dollars towards it, right? And there was like lots of things happened through that. But then the problem is this. Now, there, there's, sorry, there's a, there's a, uh, that we learned. Then she got asked by the International Banana and Plantain IPIMAP. Uh, INIPAP. INIPAP. Mm -hmm. That's based in Malaysia. That is actually giving the planting material to Chiquita that produce 75% and Bell and um, the canned pineapple, Del Monte, those ones with 75% of the trade. <laughs> and probably they were in Cuba before. Yeah, here you go. Okay? Dol, dol. Yeah, yeah, and before they get booted there. <coughs> <laughs> Dolce, Kira, and United Fruit, they own 80% of the land in Cuba. Oh, they are Cuba families, and, and then okay. American companies own 85% yeah. of the land, millions of acres. All bananas and dates. Yeah. Until 63 years ago. Uh, 1959, yeah. yeah. So that, that young woman there, she was just a student when we met her, Dorothy, and, and an intern uh, in the NGO that we were working with and we have worked for 20 years with them, just about. Uh, she went and collect, and then she got invited in Malaysia to actually learn descriptors, and they say, all we need 
is an exchange of plant material. We train them, you give her the banana. That's so much. <laughs> well, excuse me. <laughs> I mean, we're not teaching people to be to hold everything, and that's up to them. But there's memory of understanding, and uh, that's always weighing in the balance of. Uh, so the banana you get in supermarkets is generally goldfinger. It's called common resource. But goldfinger, the bananas are very prone to disease, like wheat is, and so they need to go back to these more rustic varieties all the time. Like Chiquita needs to go um, uh, to perhaps back to this five-minute banana. Yeah. Like in Costa Rica, Chiquita has uh, bred uh, already uh, GMO bananas, and in the, the in. Ten years ago, what I've read from their website, now it's changed, no doubt. They say, uh, we will, the director of marketing and all that say, we will be very patient. We will not push a banana down the throat of people, that's what he said, actually, of the public. So that's public resistance. And when people say no, they won't be able to do it unless they you know, get so impatient and say, bang, don't tell them. That's what happened in America. People eat GMO, they don't know it. That's what happened here too. So have you seen bananas that go upward? When, you know, most bananas come down. Yeah, yeah. The, these um, troglod trogloditerums are, um, or fe, uh, or soa in uh, Samoa, they're called soa, soa. Um, uh, grow upward. And they're always fat, and they're uh, entirely different species of musa. By the way, musa is the word in um, Aramaic for banana. So a lot of botanical names uh, are the local native name. In uh, East, in, where, where, where? in Lombok, uh, a month ago, two months ago, we we pointed out to a, a, a tree. What was it? And uh, uh, a fruit tree. And the guy. I used the botanical name to describe to Jude because I didn't know the the, the, the name. And the man said the same name. He said that's our word, you know. <laughs> so, right. Many times it happens, you know. Many, many, many times. So in. Um, Palau in Micronesia, they found this karat banana, which is they've mm -hmm. tested it and they've kind of made it you know, a famous banana in the banana circles, um, not the permaculture banana circles, but <laughs> um, uh, it's uh, ten, has ten times the pro vitamin A and carotene versus a Cavendish banana, which is the second one beside Goldfinger that's used. Ella Engerberger found out about that. American living. So you can imagine that perhaps the banana breeds would be interested. Um, so yeah, so co colourful plants are chosen. For example, purple carrots. Now, how many people have had grown purple carrots? Quite a few of you have got had the rainbow carrots, yeah? Or, yeah. Grown commercially in Tasmania. Right. Well, carrots were domesticated. They're a bush food of um, Afghanistan. Yeah. I like to say that often. <laughs> And yeah. di di this guy there has got a, he has a, a cauliflower field and that's pretty new in Afghanistan cauliflower, very high price. And uh, he was really proud to tell us, really, I hardly say anything, that uh, he puffed up like that, you know, and he said, we use insecticide and all of that, you know, like, we don't, you know, like those, of course, we have to talk to him later, you know, really. And that, that's the role of the agricultural scientists that we were, and the teachers that we were presenting and teaching, we also did secondary school in Afghanistan in 2002 and <coughs> three. One, two and three, mm -hmm. just after Bin Laden left. So we went to a restaurant where they said, oh, I used to sit here. <laughs> right. <laughs> in Herat. <laughs> no, no, no. <laughs> they said that was his headquarters where you eat now. Of course, the most poshest place. <coughs> and, oh, I'll stop. <laughs> These are the stories. <laughs> so here we go. <laughs> So this is in the shop in Herat, in Western Afghanistan. They're mostly purple or blue or black um, carrots, with ah. some yellow and... and um, cauliflower, yeah. And this is the little store where you get your carrot juice, your, your purple carrot oh. juice in the street. The man rolls his little trolley around and um, you, you get them. It's expensive, only the rich, really the people with the motorbikes and stuff like that do it, or with chauffeur. And that costs about like 10 cents or something. So it's not like the carrots you buy here. They've all got characters. Yeah. See, I've put the, left this slide. I thought yesterday, oh, you've all seen purple, uh, orange carrots before. But there are some red ones amongst it. And they're all different sizes. And you know, that's just how it is. Do you ever go for the, the apples with the spots on them? Because you think, well, if the insects like them, then I probably like them. <laughs> <laughs> well, 
Well, it's another story, but quickly on, on um, um, you can repeat it and research it. Yeah, research and repeat. Uh, that uh, lots of leaf vegetables, when they get attacked, it's been tested. There's, there's a number of people have done that, uh, universities. They found out that there's a <coughs> pesticide response. Uh, uh, the, the plant produces more pesticide. And then also the, the sini green, the, the antioxidant that comes in. Which we'll see later. richer when the plant is attacked by insects. <laughs> What's that? Um, we'll see that in a minute. Um, oh. Okay, so yellow carrots. You've grown yellow Forgot. carrots. This is in Iran. We took this shot. Um, so it's now trendy, isn't it, to mm. have... And this is an FAO photo, yeah? So, yeah. so they love uh, showing diversity. So the Asgro was bought by Monsanto, and now they've got it's selling in India, this shot, uh, Chantenay. Uh, carrots. This one was in uh, in Colombia. Oh, sorry. And we nearly got. Uh, I was with NGO, and they said, "Michel, it's going now. Please, please, please." You can see those guys. They had big B A B S F B B A S F, one of the six biggest pesticide corporations in the world. They had really big signs and and whole um, um, and uh, big guy in black with, with with guns with you know like the the FARC. And fuck, present everywhere. You could see signs return if you move. Oh gosh! And those guys got scared out of me being nosy because they say, "No, we live here, and I'm aware of it." Mm. You don't want to create trouble for those guys that are locals. <laughs> so the Chantenay carrot was that invented by Monsanto or the French or mm. the Afghanis? You know, these are questions. That's Monsanto. S Grow is a company yeah, that. I said that. Uh, yeah. Mm. So, uh, so while you're in the Andes. Do you want to tell this story? Yeah, because <coughs> uh, I was there. <laughs> yes. <laughs> yeah, those guys had no clue that they could actually sell the seed of their carrots because they always have harvested all their carrots together at once. So they never let them go to seed, never let one even, because they very preciously sell everything side value mm -hmm. on the market. And when they found that out, that was enough. They said, this is it, we're in business. So what the, this guy there, uh, Javier, will do is got a network uh, uh, um, decemia, red decemias in, uh, in uh, Ecuador and Colombia is going to Colombia too and Peru he uh, that's his job now to actually find traditional variety that are in the end is that they arrive in the very early days because they are villagers but because people live in altitude you never know what this village got at 3200 meters altitude in a valley that got three houses how would you know? That's why we should not say, oh, we'll bring seeds, those poor people there have got most everything, actually. So this is a shot in our garden. This Let is quite find. easy to produce your carrot seeds. They just got mount to seed, and, and um, the, the middle one is the best, the queen, yeah, right in the centre, often with these um, plants that produce seed heads, that you get the biggest amount, of the best seed in the centre. Mm -hmm. And um, one of our son's friends, he's doing his carrot humble meditation. Fifteen years ago. <laughs> Cleaning the seeds. Uh, so, so let's look at onions now. How are they propagated? So and that they were domesticated in Afghanistan and the, that area also. Pamir. In Mountains. the north of northern Tajikistan and so forth. Um, and they're reproduced by seeds and by offsets. And so the Egyptian walking onion. So, um, we got a, bit, a clue about this in Cuba actually 17 years ago. People were saying yeah. that you can reproduce celery and beetroot and cabbages by offsets off the side. And you know, fennel does this too. Mm -hmm. So you just take the little plants that grow, sometimes grow around the edge and reproduce from that. You're nodding. Sounds like you've done it. Yeah. yeah. <laughs> it is the, actually the East German in Cuba, you remember them of course. Uh, they were very friendly because they were exchanging, you know, the communist blocs. And uh, they're the one that actually studied that very, very closely, with the Cubans, of course, but they're the one that published it. And uh, it was very interesting to see all the different plants, like celery, like Jude was saying, actually planted by cutting in Cuba. So something to follow, you see, if you're local. And if you've just, you're just one person and you've got a big pumpkin, something else we learned with you, Roberto, was from Ferrandini, near yeah. the old fort in Habana Vieja, um, <clears throat> that he just cut a slice off his pumpkin, you know, say a, a quarter of the pumpkin, and he'd leave it in the garden, 
go and cook that and come back, you know, next week and have some more of the pumpkin. <laughs> Even on the plant, yeah. And what, what this guy did, well, that's, in a, that's in Iran, this picture there in the Mashal. Uh, the diversity of that. They've got big seed company in Iran. However, uh, they, they have got their traditional variety, you see. That's a matter of capitalism and that for an NGO. Say, I'll buy the whole lot, you know, and we'll, we'll try testing and see what's best and redistribute. That is the NGO work, right? Not to buy seeds from everywhere, sorry. Um, so rock melons and, and watermelons were domesticated in Africa, the bush food there. And um, however, Central Asia and including Afghanistan um, is a secondary center of diversity. Beautiful, isn't it? So oh. the, the, it was the season when we got there, and um, there was just huge amounts. So they've also arrived in Russia <clears throat> about a thousand years ago with Arab traders. So you know we've been moving our seeds around. This is an example. We've got a lima bean at home called the Madagascar bean. So it's made a trip from Lima to Madagascar to our place. <laughs> and to your place, no doubt. <laughs> um, so is Japan the new centre of watermelon diversity? <laughs> You know, they used to have got a box, they a got wooden it. box, yeah? That's all right, why not? So we've convinced you that you should save seeds and be interested in all this. Okay, good. So this is the economy of it all. Uh, ten plants of tomatoes or chilies or lettuce can give you an awful lot of seeds, like um, 480 seed packs with 50 seeds each and so on. You know, a lettuce plant can give up to 10,000 seeds. In one lettuce plant, you have a really, really healthy one. So by all means, buy seeds, even buy Green Pasha sponsoring this event, but don't buy it twice, <laughs> <coughs> only once. So fasten your seat belts, there's big changes coming, bad ones. Um, more yield leads, so this is the payoff we've had, but your, more yield through corporate breeding, we have less nutrition, we'll go into that. Longer shelf life, perhaps means loss of taste, uniformity and, and nutrition, uniformity means loss of diversity, Here's one, we look at this as bad seed bank, we'll, we'll go into that mm. in a while. And the public taste has been undermined to accept us tasteless and stale but perfect looking produce. Mm. And without adequate nutrition in our food, we need to eat more, perhaps hence the increase in obesity. But this is the kind of thing that we're up against in nearly every country we work with, is imported food, mm. processed, highly pack and packaged and, um, and these are the kind of people. Even this guy, he's got his Coca-Cola can, you see? in the Huli tribe in... Tribe in um, That's where we had a seed program because we had one of them coming to visit us through the Solomon Islands, then they come to Australia, then we just go and run a few courses and let them run, you know, they are very smart people, good hands. And that's why we concentrated, before Community Garden got very big, you know, it's worth focusing on, we think, now, right? And seeds have to be in every community garden, there's no having one, no reason not to have it. But a while back we said, listen, we're wasting our time in Australia, you know, you need to hand feed people all the time. Just go in places, go to India where kids want to learn, they want to do it, you know, and where everyone is assisted, forget about it. It's just kind of like a download. <laughs> okay, some more. Um, <clears throat> you may have seen this before because I have shown people before, and there's a paucity of these kind of studies. We're going to show you two on brassicas and on apples. Modern breeds versus ancient breeds. Yeah? <clears throat> so uh, back in uh, 96, uh, they found that broccoli and Brussels sprouts, which are bred now for bland taste, you know, you go to the, he's told broccoli is good, you know, a very good vegetable to have, it fights cancer, it does this, this and that, but you go there and it looks perfect, you take it home, it doesn't taste like much. In my my um, bonsai broccolis taste a lot better than those. Mm -hmm. um, this is because they've bred out those glu glucosinolates that Michelle was um, referring to earlier, which um, repel insects. They do, don't like to eat the glucosinolates, they're quite bitter. And of course now when you cook these vegetables, the cabbage family, they don't have such a strong smell. All related, yeah? So synegrin and glucoraphane, raffinins, sorry, are, um, are the two main um, glucosinolates. And um, the second one becomes sulforaphane upon chewing and upon chopping. So sauerkraut releases this. This, um, and this um, glucosinolate. And if you look at the caldo verde, the soup in Portugal that started with garlic, water, nothing, nothing. Potato, fried, potato. And three potatoes, and you got the soup, they, and a bit of salami right at the end. They cut very, very finely with a very, very sharp knife. Leaf of. Uh, These ones? 
th this kind of um, it, it's it's all of Australia amongst Portuguese people. You can find it everywhere. They roll all the leaf together and then they shred it and they increase the nutrition. I was thinking, why do you have shredded cabbage in Porto, in Lisbon, in all the villages we went to? They're not stupid. They're not stupid either when they uh, before a meal when they put a, a lemon, not a lemon juice. Slice, three slices of lemon because you've got the vitamin P that are leaching, that are soluble, that are leaching in the water. From the pit. Why wouldn't you? Yeah. <laughs> From the pit, yeah. <coughs> Thank you. So, this is Michelle's uncle Dede, and um, his broccoli going to seed. And he kept all of his seeds yeah. um, in the eastern part of France. in all his potatoes And, yeah. Okay, so going on to apples. These are actually wax apples at the Spotswood Museum in, um, in um, Melbourne. And there's a whole collection of these fruits, in, in pears as well, in Adelaide Museum of Eco Economic Botany, um, made in the 19th century. So, yes, it was the best example of, of diversity you of apples. You can sit in the centre if you can't see. There's a whole range of uh, space here if you want to. Yeah, sorry. We were very excited when we went to the, internet, to the um, Australasian Permaculture Convergence in New Zealand in, in um, April to meet with Mark Christensen, a, a person who'd been a hero of ours for some years was since we heard of his study in 2000, beginning in 2000, on 59 apples. And he did it with a university in Christchurch and then he had the results um, confirmed by Harvard on um, the level of flavonoids... Mm -hmm. and uh, in, and, and in Rennes in, in France, um, and polyphenolic acids. Which he was trying to find out about medicinal properties of, uh, in apples, how many apples does it keep, take to keep the doctor away. Mm -hmm. um, and he found that in both the skin and flesh, the seedling varieties have, the, in general, the highest um, levels. The commercial varieties have least, and traditional varieties have, have good levels. So you, you can <laughs> see those results. Um, it's the New Zealand Tree Crop Association that so grow by first started seed. this. And then he's continued, oh, so in particular, Monty Surprise was a seedling on mm -hmm. the side of the road, and he's that continued with another 250 varieties of apples. So it, when you grow by seed, the root system is deeper, because nowadays, uh, all over the world, you've got Jonathan, you've got the same kind of uh, breeding that often patented new variety of uh, apples, and they grafted, and they often graft them on, on, on the, on the shallow, rootstock. On shallow rootstock so it can absorb more nutrients quickly and more water. And they don't care whether the tree takes 20 years to actually reach its maximum and give you an amazing nutrition. Because mm. you don't sell nutrition. They don't sell nutrition. Woolworth doesn't sell that. Fresh? Fresh from the fridge, yeah. <laughs> uh, and therefore, uh, we must let plants mature longer and when they're seedling, you have a chance to actually go really deep. There's reason to rootstock thing. I'm not saying we should not graft at all, but we should also think to actually enact and replant by seed just to try if we have the space. If you don't have space, use a tub. You know, you plant 100 seeds. It's lovely sometimes to have a many different fruit trees in one one spot. one spot. It's interesting. In North Queensland, uh, Julian had a friend where we run a course there, had uh, several avocado in one, just near each other, like six or eight of them, and they're there nearly all year round. All seedlings, not grafted. Um, I was very happy with I, I copied this from a website on Z Sweet. Now Z Sweet is the major breeder of stone fruits um, and it's based in California and it's now it has arrived in Australia two or three years ago. Have you seen this marketing oh, yeah. la labels on apricots and plums and peaches? And guess what? They're, they're called Zyger um, genetics and they're not genetically engineered but what they've done is they've bred fruit to have less acid and more, therefore, taste yes, sweeter. Vitamins. Have you noticed how the apricots are getting less and less tangy mm -hmm. and more, more bland in flavour? The ones, 
Yeah, I know, I know. It was awful. I was brought up in Adelaide, you know, where it's apricot heaven. And you, on apricot, you know that the, we are used to, in, in Australia and France, lots of countries, we used to uh, orange apricot. Mm -hmm. But the best apricot are the orange. And they're the one you find in Afghanistan. I wonder why did I was given in the 60s, people would be giving you, uh, you know, people are so generous, you know, the Afghan, incredibly hospitable, generous, like maximum. And they'll give you apricot, then they'll sit with you, crack the seed, and give it to you. <laughs> we'll be just sitting and eating. Incredibly grateful because they're the type of uh, varieties and, and sub branch of apricots that have got edible kernels. Wow. And you pay the price for that, you don't have the color. Oh, it's it's huh? Okay. And, and by the way, Cyber Genetic is a family owned business. It's mom and dad with three or four very nice kids that all graduated in genetic, in business, in everything. They're really a nice family, but hey, they're screwed. <laughs> <laughs> so, um, what, so the alternative is um, locally adapted the varieties. They're, they need less inputs, they're more reliable no matter the climate. They do adapt to climate change because they're so diverse. Yeah, they have more options if it's going to be wet or dry this year. Um, they're longer bearing, so the harvest, they suit polycultures. So somebody was actually saying yesterday, why, why don't we have a special range of seeds? You, David. Um, um, for, for shady places, because here in the city we've got a balcony, we've got sh high buildings shading us, um, and the breeding now is for broad scale. Yeah, everything out in the sun. So, yeah, so if something is growing in a polyculture, it's more used to competition and shade and so forth. They're more taste tasty and this goes with more nutrition and therefore they're more filling. So here comes the really bad news. <laughs> We're going to try to go quickly because that's the bad news. And we have decided from the very beginning not to focus on protest. Just because we saw people lobbying government and giving actually false information or half baked information. Or panicking. Fred Rossignoli was a wonderful guy into recycling thing and he, he spent like ten thousand dollars on pamphlet all with the wrong information on it. And I, from him, you know, I've learned something. I said, My gosh, you know, be careful how you lobby and how do you do that. And what about getting into action? Mm -hmm. Yeah, because we had PVR happening in Australia at the same time. And we thought we can scare people, get more members, you know, scare people with a white bouquet and say, come and get your box of seeds, seed sellers can do that. We decided not to sell seeds mm -hmm. ourselves. And, uh, uh, and to work on positive stuff and not even teach anymore. We teach very rarely now. That's why we like to have a so lot this of is the, this is the kind of pedigree you get in these large scale seed corporations. You notice there's pharmaceuticals, there's chemical, British Imperial Chemicals, yeah, quite large institution, um, iconic even, um, agrochemicals in, in the mix. So it's a Syngenta. Now you can't read this, but you, there's the website there. Philip Howard at Michigan State University. Look him up. <coughs> because what he's done is this is an animated graphic where these um, red bubbles go round and eat the smaller bubbles. So it starts off with those really tiny family seed companies around the outside. And then these medium-sized ones go and pick them all up, and then the big red ones go and pick those up. So Monsanto is the largest, and then Dupont, which has, you know, it's a chemical company. The red company. is pharmaceuticals. And you've got the biolab, the, the, the genetic engineering people have gone into that. So Philip Howard at Michigan State University has also done an analysis on um, all the uh, soft drinks, ownership. <laughs> so just to close up a part of that, <coughs> Uh, Monsanto has taken Seminis, which is a um, seed company that started in um, Mexico with the son of the president, and it became the largest vegetable seed company in the world. They made their money on tobacco and supermarket food. Retailers. And they, so below Seminis, they, you can see Royal Sluice, which is a famous Dutch company. So, you know, that, that's the kind of information you'll get from that. It's an amazing graphic, too, you know, these bubbles going around eating up the other little small now, bubbles. If you look at the uh, <laughs> <you> <coughs> website and Monsanto, it's changing all the time because they listen. 
They're very good listeners. And they know exactly uh, what people are saying, Martin, and they change all the time what they're saying. And uh, now they're saying, we oh, three hundred years there's old. A, there's a website, by the way. Because they absorb Royal Sluif, that is starting from 1840 or something like that. They're saying, we are 150 years old. You know what I mean? Yeah. They're actually saying it. Oh, they're saying more things. Hello. Hello. And they also say that they do sustain our life. Yeah. Well, that's Very another sad. thing. The next slide, um, now this one is where we, we tried to storm Monsanto <laughs> headquarters in Bangalore. <laughs> and got thrown out. <clears throat> no, we tried to film inside. Well, we did a bit. That's from the film. Um, and even the, what got me was this genetic engineered seeds, for example, are not just grown in large scale, but, but um, really small scale. In fact, well, that's coming up too. So this is a kilo of um, corn seed in uh, Colombia. Um, not a, th these seed companies too now are much more cooperative with one another. They don't fight one another, so they give these cross-licensing agreements uh, so that they're not fighting about patents and so forth anymore. However, that, yeah. However uh, that's gone to the corruption, international tribunal and all of that on fixing prices. And since 2009, they haven't even given uh, an advice yet. Who? You know, well, the, the international tribunal. Five minutes, Jude. <laughs> Here we go. Svalbard um, is a gene bank that was announced, you know, five or six years ago. Well, um, there it is. It's in the Arctic Circle. Um, just go back to that. Sorry. Um, our argument against this is that it's a long way away. It's very cold, and therefore the seeds are not adapting to climate change. Heat, you know, mm -hmm. you know hotter climate, um, and um, it's controlled by large-scale governments and and corporations anyway that help to get the whole system of um, banking the seeds away. Um, so if you do conspiracy, I'll give you one. Uh, uh, um, uh, Amish, we, look, we have to keep okay. going because yeah. we've got yeah. 10 we minutes by Michael. Yeah. <laughs> well, we got um, given five by Fiona. Mm -hmm. so, <laughs> Tough, um, eh? <laughs> um, so, look, th these are our arguments against that. Um, they obtain their seeds from poor people and, and public domain collections, and then they take them and virtually lock them up and so it's a co and with red tape so that the corporations can privatise and patent the seed. And they have climate ready and organic seeds now. They know where the money's going. Um, so the BT cotton that um, Avandana mentioned in film last night um, is used in 95% of the Australian crop. So I would avoid cotton seed oil and ask your fish, fish and ship man um, is he using the cotton seed oil because that's where the GE will end up. So this old um, sadhu type character we met and he said Is he not him? He's a cotton farmer and he lamented that his children were growing BT cotton on his land while he prefers the old varieties <laughs> and it was tiny fields, smaller than this room. Yeah? So it was just broad scale. And it blows everywhere, like you can see cotton in the wind. You know all the trees gone, lots of wind. Oh my god. That's in Vietnam. You know, Hi hybrids. Ah, uh, hybrids are holy, you know, they can't. So in North Vietnam, this is, they deforest the hillside, the green Hmong people, um, to grow maize. That's during winter after the maize Because crops. of the bar fuel story, the price went up of cereals, yeah? To grow up, to buy a motorbike. Which is fair enough. <laughs> um, even tribal people in India are growing these kind of hybrids. These tribal people, the Sologra, the ones who uh, Karma Dorma got her seed from. Um, we were visited them early, very early in the morning and they'd had elephants come through their field but they had to let off fireworks during the night to get the, get the elephants away from the corn. Um, in Zimbabwe when we organised some seed network in South Africa you can see all available is hybrid. Did you see that? Yeah, everything is. In and nestled before <laughs> and, and near it. So what we found in the, in the tropics is that often in um, mountainous areas there'll be lots of vegetables like, and strawberries, for example, grown for these distant markets because they have such a good climate, cold climate, cool climate. And where do they get the seed? In the shop with the pesticides. That's from the film. 
So in Iran, that's what you have. In fact, throughout the third world, you have pesticides and seeds sold so the, together. The Swisher shop are always the seed pesticide shops. <coughs> so our, um, perhaps the most shocking footage last night was of that man at the beginning pumping, yeah. you know, in a, in a yeah. bit of a trance, pumping the, the pesticide, the mm -hmm. agrochemicals out. And in our film, that, that's filming during the, people go, whoa. It was a tea plantation. Mm. This is a man from Flores working in Malaysia. And these are NPK. Fertilizer rubbing in the highlands. New Zealand. Herbicide again! Woo! <coughs> so aid agencies distributing seed like Michelle was talking of earlier. And Not that teaching them. See there? That's in Timor. Mm. Yet seeds. Repackaging. Mm. Whereas we think that they should be surveying, and that's what we taught them, right. to survey the local markets. That's what we stand for. Mm -hmm. All well, hybrid seeds there. Well, no, there's, um, I've looked at this many times, and there's not just uniform stuff. So I wouldn't save the seeds from that broccoli, or those radishes, or the turnips, but I would save it from that celery right. there. See the celery yes. in the middle? There. Um, there. <laughs> Nice and uneven. Perfect. <laughs> <laughs> so, um, Fiona, not here. Uh, I was going to get you to suggest your solutions, and perhaps we will. What can you do in your community garden and school garden to preserve some of the local diversity of fruit plant, plants? Or what do you do? Um, Kate, do I know what you do? Tell them also about your grapes. You've got a grape collection. Yeah, we've got lots of different grape varieties, about 20 um, at the school, and we propagate them every year and send them home. This is She's at Black in the field. In, uh, <laughs> yeah. At Black Forest Primary School. Yeah, yeah. in Adelaide. We just in Adelaide. Yeah, we propagate a lot, and I just love putting the kids okay. to take home and to spread to their families and their friends. So mm -hmm. we do a lot of stuff. And I remember they were a dollar per pot for, yeah, the, for a grape. Cheap, free or cheap, very cheap. Yeah, for, for a grapevine to take home. So can you imagine, you know, they've got 20 varieties of grapes, in case you didn't hear, at Black Forest Primary School, a, a, you know, a built-up area of Adelaide, and, um, and it's been there 30, nearly 30 years, yeah? Um, and how many hundreds of grapes have gone out back out into the community? It's fantastic. Oh, that's right. What's happening in Australia is the nursery industry is partnering with, say, Yates. Mm -hmm. And if they're providing their product for community gardens, is there a strategy that, from the integrity of the seed, that there can be a strategy for people starting a garden? How they do that if people are funding, giving the product of the seeds? So is there a strategy to have the integrity? Well, it's a bit like land care, so as, as far as I know. Um, sponsored by Roundup. So what do you do? You start an alternative land care group, like we have in Brunswick Heads near us, non-chemical land care group, you know? So you have a lot non... Yeah. So buy seed from the smallest people, by well, your neighbours, not seed companies. You circumvent that Well, if, they, if, if they're going to say, well, we'll give you $5,000 while partnering with local government, and that's the partnership that gives the community land starts the community garden, how can the facilitators accept sponsorship, start the community garden, yeah, right. but eventually be having that integrity of the seed? Because that will be an issue of how do you overcome oh, That's a long and moral We should question. refuse their sponsorship. We're not sponsored by diggers, you see. Sorry? We never took anything from diggers. We don't touch seed companies. <coughs> we used to recommend some seed companies. It's, it's a very good point. I don't think there is a, a clear answer to that. Like I said, it's a long moral conversation mm. and it puts people in a very much of a bind when you're trying to get these things organised. So I, I, I don't think there's a, there's a way to solve it. Sure, but it should, it should be brought up as a key question that mm. the community garden itself reconsiders continually to say this is what we're yeah. having as a trade <coughs> Don't hide it. Mm. Yeah. Exchange between community garden, that's the answer. Discuss it. So um, you can see we're kind of really 
rabid <laughs> out in the countryside. We can tighten our belts. We've got our acre of food, and we can, you know, if things get tight, we can. Do that. But I sympathise with people, particularly in the city, who have salaries or salaries to pay. Um, you don't have these kind of you know, the ethical choices can be diluted. Just once. Mm -hmm. But can't you also buy seeds from seed savers? Mm -hmm. Not not from us, but you can go to a local seed network, yes. and they may have seeds yeah, like well, the Inner that, West. That, that's what we've done. I've got two packs. One is the garden in the sky. And yeah. My daughter also goes to one in the school, and I um, was interested in developing the kitchen garden there. I don't know if yeah. anyone has seen them. In fact, I've farmers market there on Saturdays, and we've got a little kitchen garden. We actually got a grant from the government, and they didn't care what we spent the money on, really. Um, but we bought all our seeds from seed savers, and then we just let them go seeds. And the kids just love it when mm. we're not, we just hang them up and dry them out, and then seeds, yeah. bash them, and then just replant them in little um, tomato containers, which is like a little individual. And you're at St Andrews Cathedral I School. I work at St Andrews, but my daughter goes to Orange Grove. Oh, yeah. 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 So I've got two little garden projects mm. going. Well, of course, the um, other thing you can do is go collect from older people in the area. Um, and it's easy to do it with perennials to start with, because then you can you know, propagate them more easily, and um, old rhubarbs or whatever. And it's always the older people that have the time for more yeah, gardening, the experience, mm -hmm. and the time to explain yeah. to you and to give you yeah. things that we, yeah. we've found. What a world of wisdom, Dan! <laughs> <laughs>